If you want to write stories your readers will love, there are three things you need to do. Understand storytelling principles, see how other writers have applied those principles, and then use them in your own work. Here on the Story Nerd Podcast, our goal is to demystify story theory. We'll help you with the first two steps so that you can get started with the third. My name is Valerie Francis. I'm a writer and literary editor, and I focus on stories by, for, and about women. And I'm Melanie Hill, writer, editor, and poet, and I have a passion for spy stories, fairy tales, and master detective novels. On today's episode, Melanie pitched The Dry so that we can study left-brained stories. This 2021 film was directed by Robert Connolly from a screenplay by Robert Connolly and Harry Cripps, and it's based on the book by Jane Harper. Of course, there will be spoilers because we can't talk about the movie without talking about the movie. And please help other writers find our show by leaving a rating and review. For Apple Podcast listeners, you can do it right from your phone. Just go to the show's landing page and scroll to the bottom. It's that simple. Melanie, The Dry, what have you got for us this week? All right. I chose The Dry because Jane Harper's books and this movie usually have two mysteries linking the past and the present. Her stories also occur in small fictional Australian towns where the environment is as much a character as the humans. There's usually a medium-sized pool of suspects, some of whom are also involved in the past mystery. And the relationships are complex and intertwined, which provides ample opportunity to discover secrets, alternative sides of stories, different recollections, and of course, lies and half-truths. Now, I haven't read the novel The Dry, but I have read um, her books The Survivors and Exiles, and I enjoy the way she focuses the reader's attention on specific parts of an investigation and not others. Harper also uses clues in plain sight, which Valerie has referred to as cuttlefish, and also clues that are red herrings. Now, the clues and diverting of attention are some of the options that mystery writers have in their toolbox. Now, I've used my spreadsheet again this week to identify other mystery craft tools that she has used in telling this story. And by tracking the murderers and looking at where clues and motives occur in the story, I've been able to see where Jane Harper used multiple techniques and tools to raise questions and divert attention away from the actual murderers. And it's fascinating stuff. Now, the first time I saw the movie The Dry, which was when it was released, I didn't think that it worked well and I was puzzled by what happened. However, and this is what I was actually going to point out this week. This is what I was planning on talking about. But as I watched and analysed this week, I understand now how the dry combines complex storytelling and interesting plotting, and I have a greater understanding and appreciation for the craft in this movie. Now, I'm not saying that it's perfect, and there are there you know there are some evidence issues, but the good lessons from this outweigh the small problems, in my opinion. I'm going to summarise and then expand on what I've picked up about the murderers and the clues in the story. But I just want to make a first significant point um, and it relates to Aaron Falk as the protagonist in this story. He actually investigates. Now, (laughs) along with um, Police Sergeant Greg Rako in this story, they actively look for clues and motives They form theories and they interview suspects. Falk and Rako's investigation combined with Falk's history in Kiwara is very interesting to watch. It's subtle but it's still interesting. Now this might seem like a really obvious thing to say but if you have someone whose job it is to investigate and you're writing a story with a crime that needs solving, then the protagonist must, must, must investigate. Structure your story around the investigation and the search for what happened. 
anything else you want to add should be done after the investigation is written or planned in great detail. Again, I know that sounds obvious, but trust me, it's um, when people write investigative stories or mysteries, um, they get seem to get distracted away from the crime or the mystery that they're trying to solve. Now, in the dry, Falk and Reiko both want to solve the crime. Falk also wants to solve the mystery surrounding Ellie's death 20 years ago. So Falk's motivation to solve these crimes drives his action throughout the whole movie. Everything else in the story is secondary to that want. And it motivates him, it then goes into his language, his thought processes, and then his actions. And it's really important and that is a key motivator for your protagonist in a mystery like this. So as an example of what I mean, I estimate in my analysis that there are about 71 scenes in the dry, give or take. There are about 14 of those scenes that don't have clues or anything to do with motive. But those 14 scenes build the background to what's happening in the past or the present. So they are contributing to the mystery in some ways. Now, what this means is that about 57 scenes do have clues, motives, or they have clues and motives in them. That gives you an idea on how heavily you must invest in having your crime at the centre of your story. Now, what spreadsheeting a story like The Dry taught me this week was fascinating. And I'll give you my top five highlights of what I actually found, even though I've got a a bit of a longer list than that. I'll give you the top five. So there are only three suspects in this film. So I've discounted Luke, who is a suspect in Ellie's death and the murders of his wife and son, but I've called him victim two in my spreadsheet because at the end of the movie, that's exactly what he is. And I'm looking for how that's interpreted or how he's presented throughout the film compared to how he ends up at the, um, at the end or the conclusion of the investigation. So he is victim two in my spreadsheet. In the movie, there are two murderers, four victims and two investigators. Memory is not linear and you should use this to your advantage in a mystery. The investigations of the present day murders are told chronologically. And that's a really important contrast between the past and the present. Now, it's going to use a bit of an oxymoron here. So specific ambiguity is your friend. And what I mean by that is choose where you place ambiguity so that you amp up the mystery. Now, in saying all of that, I'm going to go and dive into um, those points in a little bit more detail. All right, so let's have a look at timelines and memory. Now, the timeline in Ellie's murder is not chronological because memory is not perfect and it is not always linear. So the memories about Ellie that we see are from Falk's point of view. And he doesn't know what happened to her. His memories are triggered by landmarks or conversations with people in Kiwara. And it's through Falk's memories of Luke and Ellie that Luke is revealed as a possible suspect in Ellie's murder. And Ellie's death is also a secondary story that we're led to believe could be linked to the present day primary story. But I love the way that Harper has used imperfect memory and the non-chronological timeline to bring that story into play and create mystery and potentially cause some confusion. But that's okay because that's what that's meant to do. And you can get away with that as, as the memory is of the distant past. Right, so now let's have a look at the chronological timeline in the investigation and also some of the clues in that investigation. So the chronological timeline in the present day primary story holds the whole movie together and provides a more traditional structure. 
The linear timeline is also important to keep track of the investigation and where clues appear and disappear. Now, tracking when clues appear is tightly linked to tracking the suspects and ruling them in and out. So, for example, Jamie becomes a suspect when Falk suggests a motive for murder might be buying the adjoining farms to make one big farm. This puts Jamie and Grant in the spotlight, or this theory puts Jamie and Grant in the spotlight. So when Fork and Rako visit Jamie's farmhouse, a few things happen to arouse their suspicions and to also embed or support the theory that they've come up with. Jamie says, when questioned, that he was with Luke shooting rabbits, which is the lie that Falk told to the police when questioned about his whereabouts when Ali died. So it's a bit of an indication that maybe, maybe Jamie's lying. Jamie's gran also fumbles when he says he was at home with her when Luke murdered his family and then turned the shotgun on himself. Jamie also has a shotgun and is very non-committal about the cartridges he uses. So all of these add up to or, or put more suspicion on Jamie and his involvement in, um, in Luke and his family's death. Later, Falk sees CCTV footage of Jamie in town at the time of Luke's death, proving that Jamie lied. Then, after the fight in the pub, the doc reveals that Jamie was in town to see him and that they are lovers. So this is interesting. In this example, a theory is introduced, it's explored, and Jamie looks suspicious. Then he's discounted. So the chronological order is important and so are the steps to get to the truth of what happened. A different example of a clue is Karen's handwritten note on the back of a library book receipt. Now, this note or this clue says Grant question mark. Grant is the name of Falk's greatest antagonist in Kuwara. Grant also operates his uncle's farm, which is one of the three adjoining properties that Falk came up with a theory about wanting to buy. So Grant has also threatened Falk and he's partial to leaving dead calf carcasses on Falk's car or the veranda. So now Falk and Rako have a motive and some circumstantial evidence to bring the spotlight onto Grant. However, Grant's name is a red herring. The Grant on the note refers to one of the key clues that lead to discovering Karen, Luke and Billy's killer. Now, Fork links the note Grant to the grants Karen was applying for after Gretchen speaks about the work that she's now doing since Karen's left, but the linking doesn't happen straight away. The red herring played out in a linear way as part of the investigation and once Fork sees other possibilities, which is the one that links Karen's work for the school to the headmaster with a gambling problem, then Grant the Yobbo is ruled out. See, this clue works differently. It leads the investigators down the wrong path, which makes it a red herring for that line of inquiry, but when it's put in the right context, it becomes a clue that leads to the right conclusion. Now, I also want to mention two other clues that are small but important. Reiko is the first to mention that he thinks it's odd that Karen was shot by Luke at the front door. And he asks Falk, does your missus meet you at the front door when you come home? And this is the first time this is mentioned and also the last. But what it does is opens up the possibility that Luke didn't kill Karen and Billy. So this is a spider sense clue or a spidey sense clue and it's one that makes the investigators look further. 
The second small but important clue is the colour of the shotgun cartridges. The killer used Remingtons, which have red cases, and Luke uses Winchesters, which are blue cases. This is a small but valuable clue, and this clue is used throughout the movie as something that rules suspects out or rules them in. Jamie used whatever was available. Gretchen uses Remingtons, and there are also Remingtons in the school shed. So they are likely places or could be a trigger to investigate those people's involvement in the murder some more. And as an example, Fork notices what cartridges Gretchen uses and when he realises that Luke is the father of Gretchen's son and Gretchen still loved Luke, he puts one and one together and gets a very shaky two. So the point is that this small clue or these small clues are used to very good effect in the story. Now I mentioned ambiguity is a mystery writer's friend and I do really think this is a good example and also Harper's books are good examples of how to use ambiguity and how to use them in your stories. Now, there are examples of ambiguity in both the past and the present storylines. And most of the time, Luke is at the centre of the ambiguity. In the present storyline, Fork asks Gretchen if she believes Luke committed the crime and she responds by saying, common things occur commonly, right? Gretchen also believes that Luke snapped and shot everybody. When Gretchen says that common things occur commonly, that is a very ambiguous answer. So she's either avoiding the, an- avoiding the question or avoiding the answer to the question or she doesn't want to add to the argument that Luke is the person who shot his family. Luke's father says also to Fork that he knows that both boys lied to the police about what they were doing when Ellie died and if Luke killed his family then he could have killed Ellie. So that questioning also adds doubt and ambiguity around Luke. We see Luke attempting to hold Ellie under the water so he is physically violent and Luke also warns Aaron about the police finding his note to Ellie which incriminates Aaron but Luke makes up an alibi for them both. So we don't know what Luke was doing when Ellie died. But the ambiguity works because of the information that is left out. The information is incomplete, but it's enough to lead us towards a specific line of thought. Luke's behaviour is suspicious and he is capable of hurting Ellie, which means he could have killed her And if so, he could have killed his family. Or another example is that the ambiguity leads us away from the murderer. So, for example, Fork's investigation into Grant and Jamie and his thought that Gretchen could have killed Luke's family distract from Scott's time in the pub and also Scott's wife's fear of being left at the house. Now, just to finish off, When you study the dry, it reveals some fantastic ways to establish an investigation. First, the protagonist must investigate. The clues are revealed and investigated chronologically and there are different types of clues with different outcomes. And I've given an example about how the ambiguity is your friend and also there are examples in this about characters' flaws, the secrets, the half-truths, how they can be used to misdirect and create doubt. But eventually, all roads must leave to solving what happened. Now, there is more that I could talk about and there's more that I discovered, but I do need to let Valerie have some words in here because, you know, what I've just mentioned is a lot. So, Valerie, how did you go um, with traditional story structure or different things that happen in mysteries or left brain stories this week? All right. So there are two things I want to talk about. The first is a concept called the central dramatic question. 
And the second is character archetypes in a crime story or a mystery. So let me start with the central dramatic question. This is what drives a narrative or a story forward. It's the question that's hanging over the whole story. The one that the reader is reading your story and will read all the way to the end of your story to find the answer to. The central dramatic question is not unique to a crime story or a mystery, or a left brain story for that matter, not, not by a long stretch, but it is really easy to see in a crime story. So that's why I wanted to sort of talk about it this week. Now, all stories, assuming that they're working stories, of course, regardless of the genre, have a central dramatic question. So, for example, in a love story, the central dramatic question is, will the lovers live happily ever after? In a horror story, the central dramatic question is, will the protagonist survive and defeat the monster? These are super high level questions, uh, and each genre has this type of super high level question baked right into it. But when you're writing your own story, what you're going to do is take that high level question, that generic question, and make it specific. So for example, in A Christmas Carol, the specific question is, will Scrooge change his ways? In Breaking Bad, the specific question is, will Walter White get away with it? So in a crime story or a mystery then, the central dramatic question is basically, who done it? But there's more to it than that because we don't want to just know who the, the criminal is. We want to know when the crime was committed, how it was committed, and why it was committed. In other words, we are looking for means, motive, and opportunity, we as the reader. Now, as you may already know, stories have a nested structure. There are what's called units of story that sit one inside the other like nested dolls. And in fact, each unit of story has its own dramatic question attached to it. These questions get tangled up pretty quickly with conflict and stakes and objects of desire really quickly. And it's way more detail than I can get into on a podcast because it's, I would need to show you. <laughs> and we don't have all day. <laughs> But I wanted to flag it for you here so that when you're doing your own study, you can keep it in mind and you can start to notice the, the questions that are being raised uh, throughout at, at different parts of, of the movie you're watching or the book you're reading. So, for example, as a scene opens, the reader is wondering something in particular about that story, and they're going to read to the end of the scene to find out the answer to that question. And they want to know how the answer to that question complicates the story as a whole. All right. I want you to cast your mind back a little bit uh, to a few episodes ago when I talked about four story questions that we as writers need to consider. And those questions are, who is the protagonist? What does she want? What or who is standing in the way of her getting it? And what happens if she doesn't get it? Now, these are terrific questions. And you may have noticed that they're all questions from the writer's perspective. This is the way that we look at a story when we're crafting it. However, the central dramatic question is a question that is being posed by the reader. So it's from the reader's perspective. When someone reads the back cover of your book, what question gets planted in their mind? What question is compelling her to read chapter after chapter of your book? And the good thing here is that you do not have to convince a reader to go looking for an answer to the question. Looking for answers to questions is hardwired into us. When a question is just dangling out there unanswered, it drives us crazy. We cannot help ourselves. We need to know the answer. So if the central dramatic question of your story is compelling enough, you will engage your reader. So in a crime story, the question, who done it, is compelling. It absolutely is. In the dry, 
we, of course, we want to know who done it. The generic question of the dry is who killed Karen, Billy, Luke, and Ellie? The specific question for the dry is actually posed right in the film itself by Jerry, Luke's father. Jerry asks Aaron whether Luke killed Ellie all those years ago. And if he did, is he capable of killing his wife and son and then committing suicide? So from these two high level questions, a whole bunch of other questions spin out and they're spinning out the whole movie. So let me just talk about a few obvious ones that, that popped up. Uh, one of them is, is there even a connection between Ellie's death 20 years ago and these three deaths now? Why was the baby spared? Why would the little boy have been killed? What could an innocent child like Billy possibly have done? We're also wondering what Aaron knows. Was he involved in Ellie's death? Does he know who did it? Does he suspect Luke? Does Aaron think that Luke is capable of killing his wife and son and then committing suicide? Now, the more questions that get planted in the beginning hook of a story, the better. As a story unfolds, some of the questions will get answered. Others will get answered sort of partially and hopefully in a way that gives rise to more questions and other questions won't get answered at all until the very end of the story. And this is true of every single genre. Okay. It's just really clear and really easy to see in a left brain story, like a crime story or a mystery. Now in a crime story, specific questions are posed in relation to various clues. For example, and Melanie, you've already touched on this. Why did Karen have the newspaper article about Aaron? And why did she write Grant on the back of the paper? We wonder about Jamie's shooting rabbits alibi. And Melanie, you've already talked about this. So that was the story that Luke told Aaron to tell the police so that they'd alibi each other out and not become suspects in, in uh, Ellie's death. So the question becomes, did Luke tell Jamie to say that he was shooting rabbits as another way of alibying each other out? Is this history repeating itself? We don't know. Aaron doesn't know. We also wonder, as Aaron does, how much influence and control Luke had over their group as teenagers. Does Gretchen also cover up the truth because Luke, Luke uh, asked her to? I mean, if Aaron did it all those years ago, it's plausible that Gretchen is doing it now, especially since she and Luke, well, certainly since she is in love with Luke and she's born his child. So all of this to say that when it comes to driving your narrative forward, to, to grabbing your reader's attention and holding on to it until the very last page of your novel, your central dramatic question, the question that is, that is, um, applicable to the whole story, it's got to be compelling. And then you've got to pepper your whole story with smaller questions at these units of story to entice the reader to turn the page. So like, I'm sure you've heard the, the saying, you know, that book was a real page turner. Well, a page turner is a book with strong narrative. In other words, it keeps planting questions in the reader's mind and not giving complete answers to all of the questions until the end of the book. All right. So the second thing I wanted to talk about was character archetypes and, you know, specifically with respect to uh, mysteries and uh, crime stories. Now I have to be honest, I hesitated even talking about this this week uh, because for those of you who have already noticed it, it's going to sound pretty obvious. And for those of you who have not noticed it, um, this is probably going to ruin an awful lot of mysteries for you. <laughs> but what did we say a few episodes ago, Melanie? That's what we do here on Story Nerd. We ruin stories. <laughs> All right. So I'm just going to forge ahead uh, because if you're planning to write a crime story, it, you have to know this information. All right. Before we started recording this week, Melanie asked me if I was able to solve the mystery before it was revealed in the film. And I'm sorry to say that, yes, I could. Um, and I solved it. The, this is the, the murder of Karen, Billy, and Luke. 
I solved that in the scene with the posters where the, the calf has been on the, uh, on the top of Aaron's car. And then there's a whole bunch of posters put up around town. And we see the principal there riding his bike and he tells everyone to take the posters down. That's when I knew we told you there were spoilers. That's when I knew that the principal was the murderer. Uh, he was on my suspect list from the very beginning, but I mean, that's not special because I put everybody on my suspect list. So <laughs> that wasn't a tip. The reason I chose the principal as the murderer of, of the Karen, Billy, Luke murders was because he was the right archetype. Now in mysteries, there's almost always one character who is too good. He's too helpful. He's too obviously above suspicion. And a shockingly high percentage of these particular characters turn out to be the villain. Now, I didn't know why he had done it or when. I didn't have a solid list of clues that were pointing to him. It wasn't my little gray cells in terms of putting the puzzle pieces together uh, that allowed me to solve this particular uh, puzzle. It was my knowledge of story. I simply recognized the archetype and I said, oh, I bet he's the guy. I was disappointed that I was right. <laughs> I really wanted to be wrong. <laughs> now, by the same logic, I ruled Grant out from any involvement in the modern day murders of Karen, Billy and Luke, because he is too obvious. He's disrespectful. He's rough around the edges. He's prone to violence. It can't be him. He's too obvious. Likewise, I knew that Luke couldn't possibly have had anything to do with the murders of his family, or and I knew it wasn't suicide, because he's the guy being suspected. Now, if the only suspect on page one of your story turns out to be the killer, it's a pretty unsatisfying story, and it's probably also a really short story. <laughs> so that's three really typical archetypes that you see in, in crime stories and mysteries. So that's a character that's too good a character that's too bad, and a character that everybody suspects, the obvious suspect. Now, when it comes to Ellie's murder, I I can't say that I knew it was her father, but I again, I kind of thought, yeah, I bet it's her father. Again, because I was looking at the archetypes and because of something that Gretchen said. So I didn't know how he had done it or why he had done it, uh, but he is the abusive father archetype. And when Gretchen alluded to Ellie's problems at home, when I was watching it, I, I swear to God, I literally said out loud, oh, please don't tell me it was her father. Because like that's akin to me saying, oh, great, the butler did it, right? <laughs> uh, now, in the novel, I don't know how the backstory is handled. Um, in the film, it's kind of clunky. And it might have to do with the fact that they're trying to tell two stories in a really short period of time. And so the clues, when, when these little things pop up, like Gretchen saying, well, you knew about what was going on at home, right? That they stand out if you're, if you're actively watching the movie, if you're thinking, if you're paying attention, if you're actually trying to follow the clues. And then not everybody wants to try and follow the clues actively. Lots of times when we sit down to watch a movie, we're doing it to unwind and decompress. And we're not, we're not sitting there with a, a notepad and pen <laughs> and trying to connect the dots. And that's fair enough. In the film, however, I thought the clues in this one were a bit clunky. And I, th I suspect that has to do with adapting what was in the novel. And there's probably a whole lot more information in the novel. And the clues are probably provided in a far more nuanced way in the novel. And I might not have been able to figure it out there. Now, of course, it's also possible that Aaron had something to do with Ellie's murder. But typically, when the investigator is the criminal, it tends to be a much darker kind of story. So I didn't think it was that type of film. That was a guess. I could have totally been wrong. I happened to guess right this time. Okay, so there's a lot more that I wanted to talk about this week. Um, and I have a whole bunch more notes, but like Melanie, uh, I'm running out of time. <laughs> so let me just end by saying that I loved the setting for this film. And I thought they did a brilliant job with world building. 
there's a drought and a lack of water and the obvious heat created an atmosphere that is both oppressive and unsettling. It adds a beautiful dimension of tension to the story. And to me, it just helped bring the whole thing to life. So when you watch this film, I want you to keep in mind everything that Melanie mentioned in her study of world building back in season seven. And if world building is something that you're working on for your own, uh, for your own novel, take a look at this film and see what I mean. Cause I think it's, I think it's really good. Okay. Melanie, uh, what do you have for the action step for this week? Okay. This week's action step is I want you to write out the chronological timeline of your investigator's investigation. Look at when she, when she gets the clues, what theories does she have, and how does she rule suspects in or out? And then finally, what leads her to solve the puzzle? And that wraps it up for this week. Join us again next week when we discuss the game. To support the show, please leave us a rating and review and tell your writer friends about us. For access to writing templates and worksheets and more than 70 hours of training, subscribe to my inner circle by visiting valeriefrancis.ca slash inner circle and follow me on X Instagram and threads at Valerie underscore Francis. If you'd like to get Melanie's tips about books to help you read like a writer, visit Melanie on Facebook and Instagram under Melanie Hill author or find out more about her at melaniehill.com.au. And remember, story theory doesn't have to be difficult. It's a tool to help you write more, not less. So take it one step at a time and have fun. Mm -hmm.